Okay, good afternoon. Thank you very much for allowing me to be here. It's a great place, uh, as usual. Nice sun, nice food, nice audience, nice discussions. Well done to the organizers. Thank you very much. So, it's a session on locally stationary um, analysis. Uh, quite interesting, we have actually three very different approaches. Today, I will finally now talk about something yet very different, point processes, and I would like to start to point out that this is a Still a kind of ongoing project with my two uh, French collaborators, François Rueff, who is in the audience, and Laure Sansonnet, who is uh, at AgroParisTech, who has been a postdoc uh, with us in louvain la neuve and so uh, uh, the project started some time ago. And what I'm going to present today is uh, just published results in SPA about the first part of the project. So if you are really after asymptotic estimation theory, then probably you have to wait for the next talk next year. I'm just going to talk about approximation theory, how to probably define a time frequency analysis of a Hawks process. I'm going to give you an introduction, which is supposed to be locally stationary in the sense that we all know. And this is already quite mathematical, quite technical. I have to say I had to learn quite a bit of nice, deep mathematics from Francois and my collaborators. I tried to kind of uh, explain this to do by today by this uh, outline of my talk. So our uh, introduction, then quite a bit of mathematics about uh, the necessary approximation results. And then I really attack the heart of today's uh, topic, how to properly define a time-varying spectral analysis of these special kind of self-exciting pound processes. I will show you just a little bit of numerical experiments because we have a suggestion how to estimate the second order structure of such a process, but we have not really driven the whole estimation theory asymptotics through. I, part time permitting, I will give you just a little bit of insights how to use part of these approximation results also to control rates of convergence of bias and variance of all proposed estimators. So that's the afternoon menu before coffee. And then let me just briefly uh, recall that uh, Hawks processes is something that probably a lot of people here in the audience or in your laboratory know better than actually I do. It's a class of self-exciting pone processes that has been developed by Hawks a long time ago in the field of seismology, but uh, in the uh, year 2000s, it has been rediscovered in fields like genomics, neuroscience, and also in particular in uh, high frequency data in finance. The original motivation of Francois and his student was to model all arrival uh, data. And we are far away uh, from applications in this setup. It's still theory, so again, I have to make a wait for a couple months before we are really showing applications of this kind of problems. But it is clearly something which is very active, and I know uh, other people in the audience do work on this kind of processes, so I think it's relevant. Um, there are various different ways of actually um, describe these pawn processes. I will just explain in a nutshell what is around, and then I will, you know, give a little bit of insight what kind of description we use to derive our results. Basically, if you think about classical stationary and linear Hawks process, capital N, and then you can describe this with uh, the means of the conditional intensity function, which is this object here, lambda of t, is the superposition of a, a baseline, or if you think about an immigration um, model where immigrants arrive with a certain baseline intensity, yet constant here, and then all these immigrants reproduce uh, follow up, I mean second generation, third generations of children, and this is controlled by this fertility rate P, which is integrated against a point process N, and because this is written in continuous time as an integral, you know all that if you want to really uh, do the analysis with discretized, da discretized data, then this can be written as this summation here at TI are the realizations of this random point process. Okay, I will give you an alternative description which was actually very useful for us to de derive this theory which is by clusters of point processes, but I make you uh, wait a minute or two to come back to this. Now what's the aim of this work? Basically you want to model and capture time varying dynamics. 
So what people have been doing in the literature is to put a time change on the baseline intensity lambda c, but uh, to the best of our knowledge, nobody really has tried to make this uh, function here, the fertility uh, function, really depending locally on time. And you all know about these ideas of local stationarity, that you have a, a local time here, which I will introduce formally in a second, and that is our contribution to define a proper class of locally stationary Hox processes with uh, a similar dynamics, but we are not using these dynamics to, to, derive, to derive our um, theory. Okay. Yeah, so I said this uh, Channel Hall is an example for the only approach of time dependency of part of this model, and there are other point process models, of course, where it's sufficient to work only with this uh, baseline intensity function which is not, and there is quite a bit of heavy notation in, in the paper as it stands. I'm not going to, to repeat everything, I just remind you that first of all I will mostly concentrate in particular for the theoretical part on uh, the, uh, a process in variable in R, but uh, it actually applies to uh, RL. Um, uh, I will identify a point process something with a random measure with discrete support. I talked about this, and then what is convenient is to uh, evaluate this point process as a on a test function g, which means that n evaluated at g is just the superposition g of tk, where tk are the random realizations of the point process. And then you will see some functional norms coming up, which are quite important for the control of the rates of convergence. We use LQ norms. We use also something which we call a beta norm, because we want to control the regularity of the time change by some Lipschitz condition with parameter beta. So these things will show up in the following. Okay, now I come to this idea of, of cluster processes, and maybe I first show you um, a little uh, handwritten uh, transparency. You have the baseline density at some points, T1, T2, T3. You have immigrants, and each immigrant produces second generation offsprings according to a, for example, uh, exponentially decaying um, function P and the superposition of the two builds up the whole cluster of populations of these kind of self-exciting point processes, right? And so it's actually quite interesting to, to describe the dynamics not by the conditional intensity function, by this cluster process idea. So uh, you condition on the realization of the so-called center processes, which is a Poisson point process, uh, and C, it has a certain inten intensity measure and the density we already saw. And then at each center point of NC, uh, uh, an independent branching pro, uh, point process N given T generates the offsprings. That's the mathematical model behind the figure that we just saw, and you will see uh, some more formulas in a second. And then the cluster process is the sum of all the immigrants and all the offsprings of each immigrant, okay? And standard Hox processes are made stationary, we're assuming that this NC is a homogeneous uh, Poisson point process, and that the, uh, the application T to the measure mu is shift invariant, right? What I will use later in the, in the uh, description is that I use this mu um, uh, followed ST by ST, the shift operator uh, that shifts uh, along the real line, and of course the distribution of stationary processes is invariant with respect to the shift operator, whereas in our situation it is not. That's the challenge. Okay, so that's uh, what is behind this little idea here, dynamics of Hox processes. And that's the roadmap a little bit of what can be found in our first paper, which just arrived end of last year. We show, first of all, that we can actually, under some conditions of non-explosive behavior, define quite arbitrary non-stationary Hox processes, which are not yet locally stationary because we do not put restrictions on the time-varying behavior of these two functions. Then the next step, we do actually put regularity assumptions on lambda c in rescale time and also on p in rescale time. The first dot argument is the t minus s uh, shift that you saw in this intensity function here. Yeah? This here yeah? That's the first dot argument, and the second one is now the localization in rescale time. You will see that the key, the key tool for controlling this now, the existence of a stationary process that locally at some given local time approximates this 
uh, non-stationary Hawks processes. That is a local approximation of the log Laplace functional. So I'm sure not everybody is familiar with this very um, powerful mathematical tool. I try to a little bit give an intuition without going into too much technical details. And once we have this, which is kind of the core result of the paper, then we allow for approximation, yet in the population of the first and second order moments of this uh, locally stationary Hawks process. And this will later on in the work and process also allow us to control rates of convergence of bias and variance of estimators that we propose. And in particular, coming back to the time frequency analysis, the real topic of the talk, this will allow to, to define a, a existing time varying Bartlett spectrum. Yeah? Okay, that's the roadmap for today. Okay, so this is just the first part, general non-stationary process. What is the condition that it has a non-explosive behavior, that it exists? You're looking at these quite generally time-varying densities, in particular this P of S and T, and what you need is that in su the supremum over uh, time T, this thing remains integrable and below one. And then you can show that in particular, for example, the first finite moment measure is, is uh, finite, one over one minus this integral here, and that the density is uniformly bounded. Yeah? And you prove this via the cluster construction. Yeah? You cannot directly use, in particular, higher dimensions, the conditional intensity function. You need to go via the cluster construction. Each component can be constructed as a superposition of point processes defined iteratively, and in, in an iteration you use these conditions in order to show non-explosiveness. Okay. Now, this thing can quite arbitrarily evolve over time, or, or space, actually, in RL, and now we come to a more restrictive model which builds the bridge to the stationary approximation locally to this process. <laughs> and so here is the definition of a locally stationary Hawks process. We now introduce functions with controlled behavior, lambda c locally stationary and p locally stationary. And then we have, as usual, by the theory that Reinhard Dallos has introduced, a long time ago, it's a collection of processes indexed by sample size t, and immigrant intensity and fertility function p become now functions of rescaled time, which we call here um, the absolute location in 0, 1. It's a little bit different because, remember, a little t is continuous time here. Yeah? So we have to be very careful on which scale we work here. Now we work again for local time on the scale 0, 1. And uh, what is different, uh, though uh, analogous to, um, for example, the class of autoregressive processes that Rainer has already investigated in 96, here you have kind of a spectral representation that you can use to drive your um, time and frequency analysis through. Yeah, I'm not going to, th to through this, it's just a remainder. Unfortunately, this is not possible for the more elaborated recursive dynamics that we have just seen for Hawks processes. That was the mathematical challenge of this work. Okay, now a little bit about these uh, additional assumptions that I, I talked about uh, two slides ago. First of all, the first assumption is just the adaptation of the non-explosive behavior of the Hawks process. And then um, what, you, what, what you need is now that the approximating stationary Hawks process called n.u at a fixed absolute reference time u between 0 and 1 fulfills a couple of more regularity assumptions. You need, obviously, like always in this theory of local stationarity, a smoothness condition in u of the lambda c function, a smoothness condition of the fertility in the second argument, and also a uniform de decay condition in the first argument of this fertility function. Yeah, that are our working conditions, and for the precise formulation I want to refer to the paper. Okay, and now comes the mathematical tool, the um, local approximation of the Laplace function, actually the log of the Laplace function, where actually you are investigating the element NT in the sequence of non-stationary 
uh, Hawks process is shifted by the shift operator S minus TU. That is the usual formulation. You fix an uh, absolute time, say one half. You multiply it with the sample size, so you're always in the middle of your stretch of observations, and the, you are trying to approximate what happens at NT uh, shifted by minus TU. Now, the log Laplace transform, little remember, it's the log of the first moment of the exponential of NTG. That's the object that kind of gives you back all the moments, and in a multivariate situation, the cumulants of this process. And then we have a first theorem, actually it's already the second theorem, the first one was on the non-explosiveness. What you can show is, you assume your regularity conditions, you assume a Holder or Lipschitz coefficients beta between zero and one included. You take an appropriate test function on which you evaluate your uh, point processes, and you can show that the log Laplace transform of uh, NT applied on S minus TU or applied on the uh, test function converges to the log Laplace uh, transform of the process and the limiting process centered at U. Okay? And then what is very interesting, you do not only get a rate of order t to the minus beta, but what is very important for the following result is you get explicit bounds for the constants in this rate, which I didn't write down here to keep the complexity of the exposition a little bit low, but the constants depend only on these functional beta and L1 norms of the test function g that I have showed. Now you might wonder, what is this business with the test functions? In the second part of the presentation, we are going to define a spectrum which is localized by kernels in time and in frequency. And they will take the role of these test functions. And they will depend on bandwidth parameters. And we need to put them into these rates of convergence. So it's very important to have these uh, bound controls to be able later on to see how this rate will then combine with the rates of usual non-parametric smoothing, yeah, with bandwidth in time and in frequency. A first little corollary, uh, corollary as application, you can show that actually the point process, uh, uh, the finite sample point process converges in distribution to the limiting stationary approximating Hawks process. Because if you have convergence of the log Laplace, you have convergence in distribution. Okay, now this, uh, in spirit, very important uh, central theorem number four. In order to, to control second order structure, you need to control somehow cumulants. And what we actually have is we have a key result for the treatment of all moments, which is also used then in estimation theory. Remember, this is always the same thing with characteristic function, with cumulator moment generating function. You need to control the derivatives of here, the log Laplace at the origin. Yeah? That is, that is the, the technical thing. And because you can have cumulants of order up to m here, we need up to order 2. You need to do this in a kind of general way. Okay, and then you get this nice result. You can show that the cumulants of the uh, non-stationary Hawks process uh, converge to the cumulants to the stationary approximating Hawks process by this rate and this constant here. Now this, this looks pretty uh, uh, technical, but what is nice is you see, you see only controls of, of norms, of constants that you saw in the, in the conditions here, in the assumptions, and then you see what I said, these uh, L1 or L infinity or beta norms of these test functions that will play an important role later on. So that is really powerful. Okay, the first application is you can do first order analysis and you can show that the intensity measure of the approximating stationary Hawks process con of NT converges to the one of N. Yeah? So first of all, so you apply this theorem for M equal one, first moment, and you see that NT admits a uh, uniformly bound density function the limiting process admits it, and we have the explicit uh, form of it, and we have convergence of m t to m of u with the rate t to the minus beta. Okay, convergence of local mean densities, and I will show you an example of a uh, local mean density later on when I specify a parametric class of fertility functions little p. 
Now we come to the time frequency analysis. Our job is now like spectral analysis of time varying, uh, say, univariate uh, processes, define what is called a spectrum of a Hox process and localize it in time. Okay, so in the stationary case, the bothered spectrum of a second order point process, and you find this in this reference book, uh, Daily Barry Jones, that we already saw earlier today, is defined by the following spectral representation. The variance of the point process, again evaluated as a test function, is basically the integral of the square modulus of the Fourier transform of the test function integrated to with respect to a speckle density, if it exists, this gamma of omega, and here, in, for a Hawks process, this speckle density has this closed form here. Yeah? Okay, and now the job is to, to make this time dependent, time varying. Okay, now here's the idea. The object, the limiting object, would be this object, which depends now on you. So you see the Locally stationary speckle density will become a function of frequency and of local time u. It has this closed form, which is just the modification of the stationary form. You have the Fourier transform of uh, the intensity of the fertility function. You call this the local part of the spectrum and the local spectral density at local time u. And you have a first corollary that tells you that the variance of nt evaluated again at s minus t u f converges to this object here, yeah, which we defined, and we have again rate of order t to the minus beta, and again the same kind of expl explicit bounds on the constants that I showed in the theorem four previously. Okay, so that is the proper definition of a local Bartlett spectrum. Now we come to proposition uh, how to possibly estimate this um, object. So in some sense, from a theoretical point of view, the results that have been uh, published in our recent SBA paper now have been shown. In a nutshell, of course, for details, please look into the paper. But in the paper, we already proposed some kind of moment estimators of this uh, mean density function and local Bartlett spectrum, and I show you some preliminary simulations how these estimators work, and I give you a little bit of insight um, how one can prove uh, convergence of bias and variance of these estimators. Okay, remember f is a test function, which will now really uh, be, be become uh, concrete in a second, and we are working with second order structure, so we will be working with uh, a moment estimator, m is a moment function, for example, first and second moment. We will need to localize both in time and in frequency. That we all know, spectral densities are, are depending on squared modulus of our data observation. The same story here, we need to smooth over frequency to, to, to get consistent estimators. Same uh, with time, we need to localize with a bandwidth B in time. This is explained here, B1 is the time and B2 two will come in, uh, in a second later will be the frequency bandwidth. An estimator of the expectation of a moment of the limiting process is based on the empirical observation of the process is the following. You, you basically just integrate the realized observations nt of this test function shifted against a time kernel. And in practice this is of course a finite sum. We need to fix the kernel function in a second, and this is going to work for a compactly supported uh, test function so that you can uh, calculate this from a finite stretch of observations. As I said, you also need to localize in frequency. So k hat modulus squared will be our classical frequency kernel, right? So we'll have then f to be the for your back transform of this kernel k hat, we are going to actually identify the, the, the kernel in frequency by its expression in time. This is convenient. And then we want to estimate this convolution, yeah, the frequency kernel um, convolated by the speckle density. And this is this object gamma b 
2, omega, U, omega 0, U0, and later on B2 will need to converge to 0 such that this is going to localize around omega 0. You see this is absolutely classic non-parametric approach. And now in order to estimate this object for a moment for a fixed B2, we are proposing a completely classical uh, empirical variance estimator, which is the empirical second moment minus the square of the empirical first moment. Yeah? Good, and you see now that things become a little bit complicated in the sense that you have now two kernels showing up. You have the frequency kernel shifted to T u0 as the test function f here in the realization of the pound process, and then on top of it you are going to localize this by a time kernel w. Yeah? Okay. Good. And now I think it's time to really show you some numerical examples. So this is really just to illustrate. No Monte Carlo, no bias variance uh, thing that's for the next paper. We are just getting a feel whether these are sensible estimators or not. So we specified a class of parametric functions, a gamma-shaped local fertility function P, and to make it simple here, a time constant immigrant intensity, because this is really our uh, new contribution, not so much this year. The first example is uh, a fertility function which is exponential without any delay. This is the functional form, but you will see pictures. Don't look too much. It's just interesting to see that it's kind of semi-parametric. The time dependent u is now given by these functions theta and uh, theta, which are of cosine form. I didn't give the explicit formula. The second example, a little bit more interesting, it's a gamma with a varying delay delta. So you see uh, you see this show up in the exponential decay here. And this induces a periodic phenomenon in the self-excitation of the process. Only after time delta of u, the new offsprings can be generated in the process. Yeah? And this delay parameter is allowed to kind of uh, evolve possibly abruptly over time. Well, actually, it's not too abruptly. All the functions are Lipschitz one, actually, here you get explicit formula for the local mean density and for the local Bartlett spectra, depending on these three functions. And what we use for simulations, but I'm not going into any details, is now back because we are in 1D, a time varying conditional intensity, and Ogata's modified thinning algorithm, which allows us to simulate this non-stationary Hawks process with this semi-parametric forms of, in particular, P. Now, here are the plots. Uh, example one, no delay parameter, but this uh, local, theoretical local mean density which is changing over time. That is the first order uh, characteristic of the process. And this is the second order characteristic in the time frequency domain. So uh, yellow up to white is high spectral power and red is low spectral power. So you have kind of a high frequency behavior here, which changes a little bit over time. This is the process real realization where you really clearly see the effect of the mean density to be locally strong in the beginning and in the end, and low in the middle, 10,000 observation points. This is the estimator, the moment estimator of this local mean intensity. We did not, we did not at all kind of optimized bandwidth or whatever parameters is just to, to, to show that this is, I mean, from an illustrative point of view, uh, kind of working. And this is an estimator of the local Bartlett spectrum, which in the population looks like this. Yeah? OK. Second example with the delay parameter and the constant local mean intensity. So in this example here, this object is constant, so I don't need to anything. Here it's, you, see, you really see this kind of delta behavior, this delay behavior which, which shows up in the theoretical local Bartlett spectrum. And this is a realization of this simulated Hawks process, uh, much less obvious to really see the model behind, of course. And this is the estimator which once again shows this kind of uh, behavior that we saw in the true population spectrum, but which is far off being an optimized estimator. 
And now I think I have something like five minutes left, is that right? Okay, and that's perfect because in the last five minutes I can talk about the last thing, which is uh, results in progress, to give you an idea how our theorem about this explicit control of the, of the approximation can also allow us to develop our rates of convergence for bias and variance. Actually, the bias part is more or less done, whereas um, for the, for the uh, Bartlett spectrum, whereas the variance part is still under development. But I start with the estimation of the local mean intensity to give you a flavor and to explain you the techniques, because that is a much easier object to estimate, right? So how would you estimate the limiting uh, local mean intensity? You would take just a time kernel again, shift it to your reference point and integrate with respect to the point process, yeah? Very uh, kind of obvious first moment estimator. And then under some suitable conditions or integrability of the kernel, Again, for a Lipschitz beta between 0 and 1, you get a bias behavior, which is B1 to the power of beta coming from the time localization of the kernel, and T minus beta, the approximation rate uh, of the non-stationary by the stationary limit process. The variance behavior is like this. Unfortunately, there is a kind of anomal anomaly here. You don't get the square of the bias, but you get actually the bias rate show up in the variance rate. And if you uh, do the equilibration bias versus bias squared versus vari variance, you get this MSE rate of convergence, which is a little bit strange, but still very much in a non-parametric uh, flavor. Okay. Uh, principle of the proof, remember in the main theorem, I'm not going back because uh, it's, it's easier here to see for m equal 1, you get these explicit bounds of the constants and these bounds depend on L1 and L beta norms of the kernel function, the test function here and then because you can control this easily you get this rate of convergence. Same thing for the variance, the variance is now uh, a product of two things because you have two test functions, m equal 2, you get L infinity, L1, and beta norms, and if you put everything together, you get the announced rates of convergence. And this same principle is also used now for investigating the asymptotic estimation theory for the local part of the spectrum, but you can imagine it's much more complicated because you get cumulants of higher order here, you know, of order 2. So once again, what you need to uh, control is the moment, the behavior of the moment estimator of first order squared and the one of second order. And you have two kernels, as we saw, the W and the K kernel in frequency, the W in time. Uh, we use again this uh, important theorem. Uh, we probably would like also to prove a sample limit theorem for this, let's see. And this is the flavor of the bias expansion that we have. And you get a mixture, of course, of non parametric rates that you rediscover here, like t times time bandwidth time, times frequency bandwidth, approximation terms that come from the Lipschitz behavior of the regularity of the localized functions, and fortunately you can, I mean, you can really fulfill all these conditions that I have um, summarized here. And then in the end you have also the traditional condition that the frequency bandwidth needs to shrink to zero in order that uh, in the end you get a fully localized speckle density both in time and in frequency. It's time to conclude. What did we see today? We saw the possibility how to render a very famous and useful class of self-exciting point processes, Hawks processes, locally stationary. Uh, we saw the parallel to existing, like time varying autoregressive processes, but the dynamics is much more involved. We don't have spectral representations, which would have made the world much easier. The key to success is approximation theory for local Laplace transforms and control of its derivatives because they con give control of moments and cumulants. Uh, we showed existence of local mean density and local Bartlett spectrum via control of first and second moment structure and its convergence. And work in progress, as I said, is to 
now do the accompanying asymptotic estimation theory and also provide applications to interesting real data from the fields I mentioned, like genomics, finance, seismology, or other fields of applications. Thank you very much. <laughs>